Let me, there she is, she is there. Bonjour, Marie-Claude. Bonjour, bonjour, good morning, uh, good but afternoon. The, <laughs> but the fact is that as Canadians, we don't always deal with the police. We, always, we don't always deal with, with the courts. But the first thing that pops into our heads when there's a problem of racism is our, our, our commissions. We're at, for better or worse, we're, we're a highly structured and organized society. And the first thing that pops into people's minds when there's a problem, and you saw it from the questions uh, to Peter Flagel, the first organization that comes to mind is the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Uh, my old professor and, and boss, Erwin Kotler, certainly drummed it into a generation of us. And it's really a hot seat. And I'm not sure many of you understand what a hot seat it is, because yes, you have a tremendous power to do good, but you're also, for all the good you're doing, you're the target of every frustration of Canadians. Like, why aren't you just fixing it like that? And that doesn't always happen. But we're very fortunate in this country to have an extraordinary uh, chief commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and that's our next guest, Marie-Claude Landry. Et c'est pas seulement une personne très spéciale dans les travaux qu'elle fait comme la présidente euh, de, de, <coughs> de Commission canadienne des droits de la personne. Elle fait beaucoup des de réformes, elle, elle fait de, beaucoup de, des initiatives majeures, euh, notamment la réorganisation et simplification de la process des plaintes. Elle veut détruire les barrières pour accès aux justices à tous les citoyens et citoyennes du Canada. And I'm struck, she uses this expression, access to justice. And when I was in the Justice Department in the 1980s, just out of law school, the first project I had to work on was access to justice. And the work that Maitre Landry does uh, is helping to achieve that because it's a systemic problem. We talked about systemic problems earlier of racism. But sometimes, and I, I, I don't want all, you know, we're, we're almost 300 people now, I think. And I don't want people to have this impression that you've got a typical bureaucrat in Marie-Claude Landry because her background is fascinating. She's a lawyer. She's an avocat d'amérique of the Barreau de Québec. But all her life, she's paralleled her legal work with involvement with the most vulnerable. She set up organizations that helped uh, people who are literally in palliative care, seniors. She set up organizations like the parallel Dr. Julien's work with poor kids in education. Probably most importantly, and I know this having served in the Department of Justice, she was the first independent arbitrator for complaints in the federal correctional system in Quebec. And believe me, if there's a petri dish of resistance to reform, it's the federal correctional system. And for a lawyer to come in as an independent person to take on the complaints, and you may not believe this, but prisoners have their rights too. And our, our justice system does not always put the right person behind bars. They need a compassionate ear, a, a compassionate heart, an effective hammer. And Marie-Claude Landry was all that. And the country is very fortunate to have her as our uh, chief commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission since 2015. Marie-Claude, Maitre Landry, Marie-Claude, bienvenue. Pleasure to have you here. Merci, merci beaucoup, Beryl, and thank you. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be speaking at the 28th Annual Vanier College Symposium on the Holocaust and Genocide. For nearly 30 years, Vanier College has been a leader in Canadian human rights discourse, bringing together experts and audiences to promote equality and to ensure that Canada never, never forgets what can happen when hate and tolerance and racism go unchecked. I believe Canada is in the middle of a reckoning with racism. Over the past few months, we have seen a public debate ripple across Canada at all levels of public discourse over whether systemic racism exists in our country. The fact that is even up for debate was inconceivable to me. In the days following the tragic killing of George Floyd in Minnesota, I was asked on CBC television whether systemic racism and discrimination also 
exist in Canada. I did not mince words. I say, yes, systemic racism and discrimination exist in Canada. And the denial of racism in Canada is in itself a barrier to addressing it. This is what I mean when I say Canada is in the middle of reckoning on racism. Our country is finally coming to terms with the truth about racism in Canada. With that in mind, I will center my remarks today around three key areas. One, the threat of aid in our society. Two, the Commission's human rights complaints data as one part of a larger picture of systemic racism in our society that now includes COVID-19. And three, how systemic racism is a barrier to access to justice. But just before I continue, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I'm speaking from today is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Since we're all joining this virtual discussion from various locations, I would like to honor all the traditional territories represented here. For me, the land acknowledgement is much more, much more than a formality. It is about honoring the essential role that First Nations, Inuit and Métis have held and continue to hold as caretakers of these lands. I see it just as one part of a larger effort towards reconciliation and understanding our collective past, present and future. Il est également important pour moi de reconnaître le cadre historique qui m'est propre, c'est-à-dire que ma perspective est celle d'une femme blanche d'ascendance de peuple colonisateur. Je suis consciente que je vois à travers le prisme de mon privilège blanc qui informe et limite mon regard et ma perspective sur les questions raciales. Lorsque j'étais enfant, on ne discutait pas des principes d'égalité ou de la lutte contre le racisme, ni autour de moi, ni dans ma famille. Mais pour une raison quelconque, j'ai toujours, toujours eu l'instinct, dès mon plus jeune âge, de défendre les autres chaque fois que je voyais une injustice. Mes premières tentatives pour défendre des personnes visées par la discrimination m'ont vite fait découvrir à quel point les préjugés et le racisme peuvent être profondément enracinés. Cela ne fait que renforcer mon engagement en faveur des valeurs d'équité et de justice. Ce sont des valeurs qui ont contribué à orienter ma carrière et à façonner ma vie. Aujourd'hui, en tant que président de la Commission canadienne des droits des personnes, j'ai le privilège et l'importante responsabilité d'agir à titre de porte-parole national pour la protection et la promotion des droits de la personne. La Commission est l'organisme national de surveillance des droits de la personne au Canada. Nous menons nos activités indépendamment du gouvernement. Notre rôle est de dénoncer le racisme et l'injustice au Canada de demander aux différents paliers de gouvernement au Canada de rendre compte et de respecter leur engagement et leurs obligations en vertu des traités internationaux relatifs aux droits de la personne, de recevoir les plaintes de discrimination des personnes au Canada qui travaillent pour le gouvernement ou celles qui reçoivent des services du gouvernement fédéral ou des organisations qui sont sous réglementation fédérale, telles que les transporteurs aériens, les banques ou les sociétés de télédiffusion. Many of you already know that the roots of Canada's federal, provincial and territorial human rights legislation can be traced back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The sacred doctrine, doctrine of human rights that nations of the world created in 1948 so that the atrocities of the Holocaust might never, never happen again so that hate will never again lead to such devastation. Unfortunately, more than 70 years later, Canada still has a serious gap in our laws 
when it comes to protecting people from hate. In fact, in recent months, we have seen a sharp increase in reports of hateful, xenophobic, and anti-racist incident across, and racist hate incident across the country, sorry. We want to believe that this kind of hatred is simply un-Canadian, yet it is happening here. And it is, it is an urgent human rights issue. My organization has been sounding the alarm for a while, whether in our public statements, in our annual reports, our YouTube campaign, or our advice to parliamentary committees, we have been clear. Aided threatens public safety. It shuts down debate. It violates human rights. And it undermines democracy. Aid seeks to divide us. And then it thrives on that division. Division based on where we come from, whom we love the religion we practice, the color of our skin. And at its most serious, aid incites violence and leads to real world tragic consequences. The worst atrocities in the history, the Holocaust and other ethnic genocides are all evidence of the kind of horror that can happen when hate goes unchecked unchecked by our citizens, unchecked by our government. Malheureusement, nous n'avons pas besoin de remonter si loin dans l'histoire pour trouver des exemples tragiques de haine incontrôlée. L'attaque terroriste survenue dans les deux mosquées de Christchurch en Nouvelle-Zélande. L'attaque terroriste perpétrée contre une synagogue à Pittsburgh l'attaque à la voiture Bélier contre les femmes au centre-ville de Toronto, la tuerie de masse à la grande mosquée, mosquée de Québec, et plus récemment, l'attentat terroriste à Nice, en France, et celle de Vienne, en Autriche. Nous sommes encouragés de voir que la question de la reine, notamment la reine en ligne, soit mise à l'avant-plan lors du discours du trône. La Commission sera disponible afin de mettre son expertise à profit sur cet enjeu. Nous souhaitons faire partie d'une stratégie qui est globale et qui s'appuie sur des actions qui sont concrètes et des données qui sont significatives. Ce qui m'amène à mon deuxième point. Si l'un des obstacles fondamentaux à la lutte contre le racisme est le déni, l'un des meilleurs antidotes au déni est la preuve sous forme de données et de données ventilées. Les défenseurs des droits de la personne et les dirigeants de la lutte contre le racisme réclament depuis longtemps une approche nationale à tous les paliers de gouvernement pour la collecte de données ventilées selon la race. Sans données concrètes, nous ne pouvons pas voir les obstacles aussi clairement que nous avons besoin. De pair avec les données ventilées, le témoignage de personnes ayant des expériences vécues est essentiel. C'est crucial. Nous avons été heureux d'entendre que cela se reflétait dans le discours du trône lorsque la gouverneure générale a déclaré qu'une approche globale du gouvernement fédéral pour une meilleure collecte de données désagrégées est essentielle pour lutter contre le racisme systémique. Et nous sommes d'accord. For our part, at the Commission, we are in the midst of exploring a far more rigorous system of race-based data to extract from the discrimination complaints we receive every day. But for now, what I can tell you is what our available, it's what our available discrimination complaints data is showing us about racism in Canada. Please consider this. Over the past five years, the commission has received well over 2000 discrimination complaints related to race and or religion. This marks a 51% increase in complaints we have received based on race or religion during this period. 
And it means that now nearly, nearly 30% of the discrimination complaints we have received are related to race or religion. The, the majority of these complaints are about denial of employment or denial of service, with 18% of them citing harassment. While these race-based complaints are not disaggregated by precise ethnicity, we are able to break down by keywords that are cited, cited in these people's complaints. We know, for example, that of the complaints we have received over the five year, years based on race, color, and national or ethnic origin, 24% of them cite the keyword black. 21% of them cite the keyword indigenous. We also have some good indicators of the kinds of intersectional discrimination that people are facing in Canada. For example, 21% of complaints on race or religion also cite discrimination based on disability, and 15% of them cite discrimination based on sex. What's important to remember here is that our discrimination complaints data is only one piece of a larger so social picture. It has to be put together with lived experience, with broader trends, with other socioeconomic indicators. And when we do that, the picture gets even clearer and more, more troubling. Here is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how indigenous black and other racialized people in Canada are facing persistent and systemic form of inequality in access to healthcare, inequality in access to housing, inequality in employment growth and opportunity, and inequality in other essential, potentially life-saving services. I'm talking about how anti-Semitic hate crimes remain the highest religious motivated hate crimes, nearly one on fifth of all Canadian hate crimes. I'm talking about how one in five Muslim Canadians say that they have experienced discrimination due to their religion, ethnicity, or culture, at least once in the past five years. I'm talking about the higher rates of violence against indigenous women and girls, which went unabated during the three-year national inquiry. I'm talking about how right now in Canada, 34% 30, of First Nations women and girls and 21% of racialized women and girls live in poverty. These kinds of chronic and systemic inequalities have long existed in Canadian society. And now COVID-19 is holding up a big mirror to it all. In addition, the pandemic has widened many of these chronic socioeconomic gaps already at critical levels. Like gas on fire, COVID-19 is amplifying systemic racism across our society, including our justice system. Which brings me to my final point for today. Racism as a barrier to access to justice. One of the most damaging effects of systemic racism is that it creates conditions under which a person has little or no access to justice to fight back. In a country where every person is supposed to have the same ability to use the same tools to stand up for their rights, too many people in Canada are coming up against a justice system that has significant significant barriers. Pensez à ceci. Si une personne éprouve déjà des difficultés, luttant afin d'avoir de la nourriture sur la table, luttant afin de remédier à des conditions de logement qui sont inadéquates, luttant pour accéder à des opportunités d'emploi, il est fort probable que cette personne vivant dans des conditions de cette nature ne puisse faire valoir ses droits, n'ait pas accès à la justice, ne puisse utiliser les outils qui sont à la disposition de l'autre partie. 
un des plus grands angles morts du Canada est l'impact du racisme systémique sur l'accès à la justice. Sans l'accès à la justice, les iniquités qui existent déjà sont exacerbées et vous ne pouvez pas lutter pour protéger vos droits. L'accès à la justice, c'est un enjeu des droits de la personne, c'est un enjeu qui est démocratique, c'est un enjeu économique, c'est un enjeu social. L'accès à la justice est un des droits les plus importants qui soient. But the barriers don't stop at just the individual level. For years, our justice system has been riddled with systemic racism. Part of the problem is that in order to dismantle systemic racism in our justice system, we must recognize the critical lack of representation in our legal system. Study after study has confirmed that racialized lawyers still have to overcome significant barriers to advance their legal careers. Our country's legal decisions can only be as robust and meaningful as the perspectives and lived experience arguing for them. The same is true for those in decision-making roles. Former Chief Justice, Justice Beverly McLaughlin once said that Canadians should be able to see themselves reflected in the judges who are on the bench. She said it is important to have as diverse a bench as possible so we can have different perspectives represented. Yet today, our current Supreme Court of Canada comprises only white judges. Add to this the realities of over-policing of indigenous black and racialized people and the disproportionately high numbers of indigenous black and racialized people in our prisons. And it all amounts to a sovereign reality that for indig indigenous peoples, black Canadians and other racialized persons, the entire justice system is one big barriers. From interactions with police on the street to the court system, to, the, to our sen sentencing processes, to the overpopulation in our prison system, and to in-prison issues such as solitary confinement, the whole system need overhauling, even if one section at a time. We are seeing some promise, promising action and awareness on this, but this I know for sure. We do not need more studies on these issues. It's been studied. Now it's time, it's time for concrete action. And it is on that idea that I will conclude my remark today. The kinds of actions that we as individual can take to help dismantle racism in our country. I believe one of the first steps goes back to my main Theme, theme today, recognizing and confronting the truth about racism in Canada. We cannot, we cannot accept denial on this issue any longer. Not from our leaders, not from our colleagues, not from our neighborhoods, friends, and family. Racial biases and systemic racism may be difficult truths for some people to recognize or accept, in their country and especially in themselves. Some unconscious biases run so deep, they go undetected, unexamined for years. That is why at the commission, we have been working with our staff and our entire team to ensure an organization wide understanding of where our biases come from and how, we, how to be more aware of them and how to challenge them, how to ask difficult questions. It is part of a larger effort we have undertaken in recent years to take a closer look on how racism, even if unintentionally, may impact our processes, our decisions, and the way we serve people in Canada. 
we are looking at tangible ways the Commission can, can improve access to justice for those filing race-based discrimination complaints with us. We are actively listening to racialized members of our staff to hear directly from them about their lived experience with barriers to equality and opportunities. We are reaching out to our stakeholders and outside experts for their views on how how the Commission can improve. And we are ensuring that all this knowledge informs meaningful and sustainable action. In closing, there is an old saying that is usually heard around election period, like the one we have just witnessed south of our border. All politics is local. It is about how most of, of us are best motivated by positive changes happening right where we live. To put in another way, Eleanor Roosevelt famously said during the 1948 singing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that human rights begin in small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. So it begins in our own backyards, in our own workplaces, in our children's school, and in conversations around the family table. And conversations like ours today are another local way to shift our consciousness and awareness. It's about allowing intimate discussion like this to inspire far-reaching action. With that in mind, I will leave you with the powerful words of the great John Lewis, who wrote in his final essay before his passing. And I quote, when you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state. It is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build what we called the beloved community. Everyone here today is part of that beloved community. With those words and the words of our colleagues today still fresh in our mind, let's go forward with the intention of doing something. I want to thank again the Vanier College for being one of the greatest, great leaders and facilitator of Canadian human rights discourse. May these conversations continue to spur meaningful action across Canada. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Merci, Mertlandry. Uh... Nous avons dépassé un peu le temps, mais il y a un peu de, 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 de minutes, des moments pour quelques questions. Je vais essayer de euh, combiner quelques questions dans, dans un. Au début de la conférence, dans le matin, quand j'ai parlé avec euh, M. West Hall de Toronto, le fondateur de la coalition des hommes des personnes d'affaires contre le racisme et Michael Mostyn, le CEO de Benny Breath, j'ai posé la question suivante. Sur les grandes questions, naturellement, sur les grandes lignes, nous sommes tous en accord. C'est comment de faire les réalités. Et mon question à, à M. Hall et M. M. Morstan était le suivant. Quand j'ai travaillé avec, dans, dans le sud américain, avec la Southern Christian Leadership Conference, some of the major civil rights leaders had a concern. And the concern was this. Il y a une bataille pour l'égalité d'opportunité pour égalité de euh, traitement équitable en face de la loi de justice. But, et, et pour ça, nous pouvons construire des grandes coalitions. But the black leaders in the South themselves were worried about the following, that we are now trying to move from equality of opportunity, equality for justice, it, equality before the law, to equality of result. And when, if we try to move to equality of result, 
That's also jumelé, si vous voulez, avec un autre concept, le concept des droits collectifs supérieurs à les droits individuels. Et même les chefs de le mouvement des droits civils et les chefs du de mouvement des droits humains mondial écrit et donne les cautions beaucoup de temps que chaque société qui fait les droits collectifs supérieurs à les droits individuels avait des problèmes avec justice. Is Canada going a little too far in virtue signaling these days? And, and the final question, is it not time to have the role that you're having? Educate, persuade, engage. But maybe it's time for political leaders to say, look, we can go so far, but we're not going to go to the point where individual rights get supprimed by some nice notion of collective rights. We can go, we as the state can go so far, the rest is up to you. Not every problem can be solved. Is there a place for that kind of conversation? But, uh, thank you for your question, Andrew. I think that there is always place for conversation and we really need to have conversation and conversations are important. I think that it's always to find the right balance uh, and, and, and for me is, it's about and what we can do. I think that it's, you're talking about education. I think that we have the responsibility to educate ourselves. For too long, we were waiting to, on others to educate ourselves. And I think that we each individually have the obligation to educate ourselves on our past, our history, and what we can do to be a real ally for people who have been targeted or suffer of discrimination since years and years and years. I really believe as well that there is no competition in right. We need to find the right balance and each right are important. Collective rights are important. Individual rights are important. And often if someone is, is experiencing something, it's pretty rare that it's the only one that will experience that that often that will become a collective problem. Dernier question. Uh, this, this question I actually anticipated something that I was going to ask you. So let me, let me put it, reformulate it. Uh, she doesn't want her name used. Is there, are we using the right language? Est-ce que nous utilisons les propres adjectives quand nous parlons de racisme systémique? Est-ce que ça peut être un racisme sociétal et la seule solution, c'est engagement en éducation? Et juste pour donner un exemple concret, when I hear, not only as an editor, but as someone who I was form, uh, one time in the Department of Justice in prosecutions, I saw systemic racism. So to me, systemic racism is a commander telling police officers, a commander telling crown prosecutors, uh, a lawyer telling crown prosecutors, you go tougher on the black defendants. And I've heard that. That's systemic. But our system at a chaque niveau seems to be having people, commanders, ministers of justice, telling people, no, you have to instruct your police officers, your prosecutors to be sensitive. And still we have all these cases. So is it so much systemic as societal? And is there perhaps only so much we can do about societal? We have sanctions in place. We have penalties in place, yes. And that's important. But the language is also important. Is it perhaps the wrong adjective? It's a good, good question and a good question that can be debated by, by, uh, by uh, probably uh, many academies. But for me, is, uh, systemic, uh, uh, systemic racism uh, is, is, uh, it is what it is and it exists everywhere in Canada. And this is the discussion that we, we need to have. And I mentioned in a statement in the past summer that roots, the roots of racism and systemic discrimination in Canada run deep. Uh, we have a system. And, you know, for me, racism is not an event. It's a system. It's a structure. And it's, it's embedded, actually, in, every, in all the, the, the system, the laws and, and, uh, that we have. Yes, you're suggesting that on. systemic racism means that it's there in the law. It's there on the ground by the officers of the law or the officers of the government. 
That's what systemic means, that it's actually there. Put it here. Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's in the law, it's in the, it's in the structure, it's, the, it's in, in the, um, the uh, judicial system, it's in the, uh, it's everywhere. Matt Landry, many thanks for being here. Again, Marie-Claude Landry, a remarkable public servant, chair of the president of the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Matt Landry, merci à vous pour ce matin, merci pour cet après-midi, et merci à vous pour votre service au pays. Merci de m'avoir accueilli. Merci beaucoup. Un plaisir.